Jake Sado, Jake Sado, Jake Sado.
Bapak dan Ibu, untuk HP mohon untuk di silent. Terima kasih. Yang terhormat Kepala Badan Litbang Diklat Hukum dan Peradilan Mahkamah Agung Republik Indonesia beserta jajaran pimpinan memasuki ruang acara. Hadirin dimohon berdiri. Menyanyikan lagu Indonesia Raya dan himne Mahkamah Agung, hadirin dimohon berdiri.
hadirin disilakan duduk kembali. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi, salam sejahtera bagi kita semua. Yang terhormat Kepala Badan Litbang Diklat Hukum dan Peradilan Mahkamah Agung Republik Indonesia, Bapak Bambang Heri Mulyono SHMH. Yang mulia Hak Hakim Pengadilan Tinggi Nasional Brasil sekaligus Ketua Uni Internasional untuk Konservasi Alam, Bapak Antonio Herman Benjamin. Yang kami hormati, Ketua Pengadilan Tinggi Tata Usaha Negara Banjarmasin, Bapak Dr. Haji Bambang Herianto, SHMH. Yang kami hormati, Sekretaris Badan Ditbang Diklat Hukum dan Peradilan Mahkamah Agung Republik Indonesia, Bapak Edi Yulianto, SHMH. Yang kami hormati, Kepala Pusdiklat Teknis Peradilan Mahkamah Agung Republik Indonesia, Bapak Syamsul Arif, SHMH. Yang kami hormati, Moderator acara pada sesi ceramah umum, Ibu Grita Anin Darini, SHLLM. Yang kami hormati, para Hakim Justisial pada Badan Litbang Diklat Hukum dan Peradilan Mahkamah Agung Republik Indonesia. Yang kami hormati dan banggakan, para undangan acara ceramah umum, baik yang hadir secara langsung maupun yang hadir secara daring, yang mohon maaf tidak dapat kami sebutkan satu persatu. Yang kami hormati, para pejabat struktural dan panitia pada Badan Litbang Diklat Hukum dan Peradilan Mahkamah Agung Republik Indonesia. Puji dan syukur kita ucapkan kepada Tuhan Yang Maha Esa, yang telah melimpahkan nikmat dan rahmatnya, sehingga pada pagi hari ini, kita dapat berkumpul bersama dalam acara ceramah umum dengan tema The Model Forest Act Initiative. Bapak Ibu yang kami hormati, marilah kita simak bersama sambutan sekaligus membuka acara secara resmi oleh Kepala Badan Litbang Diklat Hukum dan Peradilan Mahkamah Agung Republik Indonesia. Dimohon perkenan yang terhormat, Bapak Bambang Heri Mulyono, SHMH, kami persilakan. Selamat pagi, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ini kesempatan yang sangat berharga sebenarnya, tapi karena kita mempersiapkannya sangat apa namanya e, cepat mendadak gitu ya. Jadi banyak yang e, ingin mengikuti, tapi kita beri fasilitas secara online. Saya ucapkan e, selamat datang untuk Bapak Justice Antonio Herman Benjamin. Ini beliau, kalau kita lihat di CV-nya, di internet, beliau sangat terkenal di kalangan para hakim, khususnya hakim-hakim lingkungan. Saya bertemu dengan saya bertemu dengan beliau awal eh, di tahun 2004 ketika ada Kongres IUCN di Bangkok. Dan setelah itu juga beberapa kali ada eh, pertemuan karena beliau sangat aktif di apa, sebagai hakim lingkungan. Uh, pernah menjabat di IUCN, kemudian uh, dulu ada Komisi Hukum Lingkungan, Commission on Environmental Law, ini di bawahnya IUCN. Sekarang menjadi WCEL, uh, World Commission on Environmental Law. Dan nanti silakan di, dibaca, ada uh, Bayu, uh, apa namanya, CV-nya beliau, nanti bisa dilihat, uh, Bahkan di tahun 2012 saya masih ingat karena saya ikut delegasi Mahkamah Agung yang hadir di Rio de Janeiro 
beliau yang mencetuskan mengenai prinsip Hindu Bio Pro Natura. Jadi ini beliau adalah guru kita, para hakim lingkungan, dan uh, banyak konsep-konsep yang digagas bersama dengan uh, Commission on Environmental Law maupun organisasi-organisasi lingkungan uh, internasional. Dan di tahun 2020, uh, sebagai penghormatan karena keaktifan beliau di hukum lingkungan, ini para ahli biologi ahli apa namanya tanaman di Brasil itu menamai se, apa, tanaman anggrek bunga dengan eh, sebutan bulbophyllum nah itu yang di slide itu adalah untuk penghormatan beliau sebagai konsen beliau terhadap eh, lingkungan dan alam kita berikan aplaus untuk beliau <tuk> Jadi saya ucapkan selamat datang Justice Antonio Hirman Benjamin. Kami sangat merasa senang eh, Pak Benjamin, Pak Antonio Benjamin ini bisa hadir di Pusdikat. Suatu kehormatan bagi kami semua dan eh, terima kasih telah eh, berkenan untuk sharing pengetahuan juga rencananya Insya Allah juga nantinya akan menggagas tiga negara yang memiliki hutan terluas di dunia untuk sebuah gerakan perlindungan hutan. Nanti Ketua Mahkamah Agung Indonesia, Ketua Mahkamah Agung Kongo, dan Ketua Mahkamah Agung Brasil, insya Allah ada satu forum yang kita menjaga, menjaga hutan dari sisi hukum. Again, uh, muito obrigado, Justice Antonio Herman de Vasconcelos Benyamin, Mudah-mudahan nggak salah ini, ada bahasa dari Brasil. Uh, selamat datang di Pusdiklat dan beliau tadi sudah kita ajak keliling, kelihatannya menikmati dan uh, apa, matching dengan apa yang kita lakukan di Pusdiklat. Terima kasih dan saya rasa ini karena forumnya sedikit agak formal, informal begitu, ya kita buka bersama dengan Bismillah saja. Terima kasih, saya akhiri. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih kepada yang terhormat Bapak Kepala Badan Litbang di Klat Kumdil atas sambutannya. Acara selanjutnya adalah sesi ceramah umum. Kami persilahkan kepada Bapak Antonio Herman Benjamin selaku narasumber dan Ibu Grita Andarini SHLLM selaku moderator untuk naik ke tempat yang telah disediakan. Baik, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi Bapak dan Ibu semua, terima kasih sudah hadir dan tentunya Bapak dan Ibu yang ada di Zoom. Um, terima kasih banyak sudah hadir dan senang sekali saya bisa uh, di tengah-tengah Bapak dan Ibu untuk sama-sama kita berdiskusi dengan uh, Justice Antonio Herman Menyamin terkait dengan satu hal yang nanti Mungkin dari kemarin saya sudah cukup banyak dapat pertanyaan, apa itu model Forest Act Initiative? So, I've got so many questions about what is model of Forest Act Initiative. So, uh, maybe we can in um, dalam waktu 90 menit ke depan kita akan banyak berdiskusi terkait dengan hal ini, Bapak dan Ibu. Saya izin duduk sedikit. So, let me introduce your, um, I make it short because this is a long bio, um, in a short about uh, introduction about you in Indonesia. So, um, seperti yang tadi Bapak dan Ibu uh, sudah dengar dari Pak uh, Bapak Bambang, uh, bagaimana uh, Justice Antonio Benyamin adalah sebuah tokoh guru uh, di bidang hukum lingkungan, Bapak dan Ibu. Beliau saat ini merupakan presiden dari uh, Global Judicial. Oh, this is not working. Um, I will um, I will conduct this session in um, uh, in English and in Indonesia for you. Jadi, uh, so Justice Antonio Benyamin, Herman Benyamin adalah uh, presiden dari Global Judicial Institute of um, the Environment. Uh, ini adalah sebuah organisasi yang uh, 
mengumpulkan atau forum begitu ya yang mengumpulkan bersama-sama hakim-hakim Mahkamah Agung dan hakim-hakim dari seluruh dunia yang memiliki fokus di hukum lingkungan Bapak dan Ibu. Dan beliau juga merupakan Secretary General dari International Advisory Council for Environmental Justice for UNEP. Dan uh, beliau memiliki list yang sangat panjang sekali terkait dengan uh, pengalaman tidak hanya di bidang uh, tidak hanya di sektor judiciary tapi juga uh, di sektor akademik uh, dan uh, memimpin berbagai organisasi-organisasi internasional. So Justice Benyamin is a former president of IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, WCEL, and um, oh you have the translation now. Okay. Dan uh, beliau juga merupakan co-chair dari INIS. Uh, the International Network for Environmental Compliance and Enforcement. Di bidang akademik, beliau merupakan uh, profesor, beliau sebelumnya adalah profesor dari Kat, di Catholic University of Brasilia School of Law, dan merupakan visiting professor and lecturer di berbagai um, uh, kampus, institusi pendidikan di berbagai negara. Uh, Justice Benyamin juga tadi uh, seperti yang Pak uh, Kabadan telah sampaikan, memiliki dan telah menerima berbagai macam awards, honors dan rekognisi dari berbagai dari di berbagai uh, belahan dunia dan salah satunya juga di tahun 2015 beliau merupakan uh, resipien dari Elizabeth Hout Prize for Environmental Law awarded by Stockholm University dan um, considered the most prestigious international distinction conferred upon an environmental legal expert. Demikian Bapak dan Ibu sekilas terkait dengan uh, pembicara kita Justice Antonio Herman Benyamin pada pagi hari ini. Saya mungkin sekilas Bapak dan Ibu sebelum saya masuk ke Justice Antonio Herman Benyamin. Um, saya yakin di sini Bapak dan Ibu juga telah sepaham bahwa ketika kita bicara hutan, itu betul-betul merupakan saat hutan adalah bagaimana hutan merepresentasikan kekait biodiversity kita. Gitu. Dan hutan memiliki peran yang sangat amat penting untuk menstabilkan ekosistem dan bahkan hutan juga bisa berfungsi untuk mengurangi environmental vulnerability. Begitu pentingnya fungsi hutan, namun kita saat ini mengalami uh, tantangan yang sangat amat besar, di mana 50 tahun belakang ini kita kehilangan banyak sekali, jutaan hektar hutan, dan, uh, dan deforestation itu adalah key drivers utama, di mana sebenarnya uh, ketika ada terjadi hal ini, kita mengalami biodiversity loss yang sangat amat besar, dan itu juga kita kita kehilangan tempat untuk carbon sink dan dan ini berdampak terhadap releasing emission. Nah, untuk mengatasi hal ini, pendekatan hukum itu bukan satu-satunya pendekatan sebenarnya Bapak dan Ibu. Forest governance is a complex issues. Di sini berbicara terkait dengan isu sosial budaya, kita bicara terkait dengan isu ekonominya, kita bicara isu tenorialnya di sana begitu. Dan um, Penting sebenarnya untuk memiliki dan saat ini memang sangat sulit untuk bisa menyusun satu regulasi yang uh, mengatur terkait dengan tantangan pengelolaan hutan ini secara holistik kira-kira begitu. Dan disinilah kemudian Justice Antonio Herman Benyamin um, mencetuskan atau memiliki sebuah ide inisiatif terkait dengan model Forest Act inisiatif yang kita akan bahas pada pagi hari ini. So you are currently developing a model right that aim to formulate a set of provisions. You have the translation, but yes. Um, uh, so why do you think this, is, this initiative is important and is urgent to, you know, um, to address current challenges? What are the gaps you see? And um, how this initiative could be the answers? So this is my question. Ini adalah pertanyaan uh, pemantik dari saya. So the time is, uh, is yours, uh, Justice. Um, and then we can have this discussion afterwards. Good morning. You have to understand that now it's, uh, what, 8 p.m. in Brazil? So, uh, the time difference is, is big, um, but I could not imagine a better way of waking up very early today in Jakarta uh, than this, to be here with you today. So let me start thinking 
my, my colleagues, uh, Justice um, Muliono, um, Justice Bang Bang, as we call him, all over the world. He's, um, he's a star of the judiciary of Indonesia, and I've been very privileged to know him for many years. And now, um, several of you that I, I do hope uh, to continue collaborating with. Also, my colleague uh, Greta Anindarini, who is second generation of the Indonesian Center uh, of Environmental Law. I have met uh, many years ago, decades ago, uh, her, her mentor, Ma Santosa, an old friend, and I'm delighted to see that uh, ICEL is still very, very active and at the forefront of environmental law developments in this country and in the region. Let me also thank the interpreter. We have wonderful interpretation from Indonesia into English. And I suppose it's even better from English into Indonesia. So I'd like to thank um, whomever, it, oh, there he is. Um, I thought you were somewhere hidden, but no, there. Um, I see the face, so many thanks for your excellent interpretation. And many thanks to all of you for being here in person and the ones that are joining uh, by Zoom. The first time I came to Indonesia in 1987, of course, the internet didn't exist. Uh, and we could not even imagine being connected with um, judges from different parts of Indonesia uh, for a discussion like the one we are having uh, here today. Let me first put in perspective what we are talking about. Forest. Rita has already mentioned um, some key points, but I'd like to emphasize a few others. If we bring to together Brazil, Indonesia and Congo Kinshasa, we have more than 50% of the tropical forests of the world. So instead of calling the G7, you are familiar with the G7 uh, concept, we can talk, and they have been uh, emphasizing this concept of um, the F7 the forest seven. And among the forest seven, we have the three, or the F3, those three countries. So it's very important that we understand where Indonesia and Brazil fit in, in this picture. In terms of size of tropical forests, it's difficult to say that we are not at the center of the stage. Second, and I will speak in term from the Brazilian perspective, of the Brazilian CO2 emissions, deforestation is around 50%. And this is because our energy is mostly clean, generated by hydropower and more and more solar and wind. Therefore, 90% of the Brazilian electricity comes directly from nature, not from oil and gas. So imagine this, over 50% of the CO2 emissions of my country come from deforestation, directly or indirectly. And I suspect, I don't have the numbers, but I suspect that in the Indonesia, that the situation would also be serious in terms of CO2 emissions. So, First, 
the three countries have this massive, gigantic tropical forest. Two, and I'm now focusing on just Indonesia and Brazil, the two countries have had in the past massive deforestation for different reasons. In the case of Brazil, it's more for cattle ranching and soya production. As you know, Brazil is the, the, the largest or the second largest uh, meat producer in the world. Uh, the same thing with soya, the same thing with corn, and we go on and on. So deforestation is for that. Cattle ranching, meat, and mainly soya. And in Indonesia, uh, it's, it's still for, um, from agriculture, but in this case, um, among other uh, factors, we have uh, palm oil as uh, a main, uh, a main um, uh, factor in, in the picture. A third point that I would like to emphasize is that in spite of having this massive tropical forest, Second, in spite of having similar problems of deforestation, the two countries don't talk to each other. They talk at the diplomatic level. There is conversation at that level, but the judges don't talk to each other. Isn't this something that should be considered unacceptable. Although we speak different language, we are on opposite sides of the world, but being far or having a different language has never been a problem for comparative law and judicial discussion. Because our partners that we speak the most France, for example, Italy, the United States, I'm talking from a Brazilian perspective, they are all three far and speak a different language. So we need translation. In other words, it's not because it's far, it's not because we speak different language that we cannot have this type of dialogue. So one of my purpose here today, and it's the first time I visit this extraordinary judicial academy, is perhaps to begin a dialogue between the Brazilian judges and the Indonesian judges. I think I'm the first judge to visit this judicial academy. And I was, until recently, the dean, the director of the Brazilian Judicial Academy. And I can tell you that uh, we never had uh, Indonesian judges visiting us. And even more important for the debate today, we never sit down together to discuss forests. Finally, in this very brief introduction, I want to uh, to emphasize that the protection of forests is not just for the protection of biodiversity. Greta has already mentioned that, you know, the, the deep connection between forests and biodiversity. But scientists tell us today that forests are crucial for the climate system. And they are crucial for agriculture. What's happening in the Amazon, the deforestation in the Amazon, is damaging agriculture 2,000, 3,000 kilometers south of the Amazon. Because of the so-called, I don't know if you heard this concept, but you can Google the flying rivers. The flying river 
concept. This is something that scientists are only now discovering. Means that if you have the Amazon River, the largest river in the world, and all its tributaries, so much water on the soil, but in fact, there are many more times or much more water in the atmosphere over the Amazon. So those are called the flying rivers. And they are generated from the Amazon itself, and then they fly all the way south to the most productive agricultural lands in Brazil, and even to Paraguay and Argentina. And in the past, we would not make any connection between the remote uh, Amazon and the south of the country. So, in a nutshell, forests are crucial. And I'm not going to mention the role of forests for generating water, drinking water. The big metropolis of my country, I'm not so sure about the, the big metropolis in Indonesia, and you have quite a few, uh, whether they face water shortage for drinking. But in my country, the biggest cities, including Brasilia, we've, we have had to ration uh, water not long time ago. So every two, three, four years now we have a drought. Things that were completely unknown in the past. All this to say that we need to have this conversation between judges of Brazil and judges of Indonesia. Big forests in the two countries, similar deforestation factors, and three, the importance of agriculture and water for agriculture in, in those uh, two countries. Let's move now to the main topic of my presentation, which is this new uh, concept that I proposed several years ago of a model forest act. Well, first of all, you probably realize that the picture that uh, Justice Bang Bang got from me, from me is from 17 years ago when I was appointed to the court. Much younger. Thank you for, um, for this. And second, that he and his team uh, were kind enough uh, to uh, have a picture of this uh, recently discovered new orchid that scientists in the Amazon uh, name after me. And I don't know where he got that picture because I've not seen it. I have it. I have the orchid with me in my garden, but uh, I have not seen um, um, the picture. So this means that Indonesian intelligence service are working very, very well. The judicial intelligence service of Indonesia. And they are very good. Got those pictures uh, of the of this a, a beautiful orchid. I don't need to say that forest legislation is one of the most diverse areas of law in the world for several reasons. First, because before the Europeans arrived, in the case of Indonesia, um, don't forget this, first the Portuguese, like in Brazil, uh, the Dutch came later. And then before the Dutch, the English, in Brazil, the Portuguese. But the Dutch tried to conquer Brazil too, and they were defeated there by, uh, by the Portuguese. But that's a separate uh, story. So, first, 
before those European powers arrived, colonial powers, some of our countries already had uh, customary forest legislation, so to speak, or norms. Indonesia was divided in many kingdoms, city-states, uh, and I suspect, and Greta and the other colleagues that are experts on forest law in Indonesia, that prior to the arrival of the Europeans, there were already norms dealing with forests. Not with, in, in Brazil, because we didn't have well-established kingdoms. We had uh, indigenous people. Uh, they were, um, uh, they, had, they had their own system uh, of political organization, but not kingdoms as you did have in Indonesia uh, or the islands that comprise Indonesia today uh, before the Dutch arrived. Other parts of the world have had forest norms for 4,000 years, since Babylon times, especially in the dry lands of the Middle East, because vegetation was so important. It was absolutely necessary to protect vegetation. This is the first reason why forest legislation is diverse around the world because in some countries the present legislation inherited concepts that existed before the codification uh, of what we call modern legislation. Then the colonial powers arrived and can you imagine the Dutch forest legislation being transplanted to Indonesia? Can you imagine two countries with a more different topography? Flat in, in the Netherlands, here mountains, islands, uh, below sea level, here you have you know, very few places that are below uh, a sea level, but that's the legislation that was transplanted to, um, to the colonies. And in the case of the Portuguese in respect to Brazil, they did have already in, and I'm talking about the 17th century, 18th century, there were some norms coming from Portugal that are kept still today and they are good. They were incorporated in the more recent legislation. Finally, the environment, I'm summarizing the whole thing to give you the picture. So finally, environment, um, forest legislation draft or reformed during the so-called environmental law era that started in the 70s and in our countries, Indonesia and Brazil, more in the 80s and the 90s. What is different now is that before forests were regulated, before this environmental era, forests were regulated as forests. Now, forests are regulated not just as an element of the environment, but from a holistic perspective, as an element that is in direct connections with everything. So often we see, for example, a blend of forest norms and water norms, or a blend of forest norms and wildlife protection norms, because forests cannot be seen just in separation 
from the other elements that compose this legal concept that is now, even in constitutions, that we call the environment. Finally, in this brief introduction, we based on new knowledge now understand that forests are not isolated from each other. One of the difference that we would make on one side forest or flora and on the other side wildlife, we would say wildlife moves, forest doesn't move. And this would affect, for example, property law regimes, different for wildlife and, and forest. Well, it's not quite like that because forests do move. They don't move walking, but they move with the help of rivers, the seeds, birds, or even just the wind. And of course, this has implications when we see a biome like the Amazon that's shared by several other countries, not just Brazil. Brazil is over, uh, uh, I believe, 60% of the Amazon but other countries share that too. Bolivia, Peru, Colombia, Venezuela, just to name, Ecuador, just to name a few of them. And one part of the forest depends on the other part of the forest that is outside the border of Brazil. And in fact, the headwaters of the Amazon many of them are outside of, the, of Brazil. They are up in the Andes. If you look at forests in this part of the world, you might say, well, you know, our forests are in islands. So they don't face this connectivity problem that we do see in the Amazon and in the Congo Basin forest. Well, we do have other types of connectivity in, in the forest, and that's why we call this as a biome. And how can you protect a biome if you have the... How can you pr protect well a biome when you have fragmented legal systems? One saying something, another saying the opposite, some, some norms stating, prohibiting some conducts, the other norms saying the opposite, they are allowed in, in that country or in that state. Therefore, there is a need for some basic harmonization and understanding of forest legislation. That's the main reason before the model Forest Act initiative. And now I'm, I'm going to say a few words about it, uh, just five minutes, and then we can begin our conversation. When I was chair of the World Commission on Environmental Law, I would get requests from governments, from scientists, from NGOs, from different countries saying, you know, can you help us? We are enacting, drafting a new forest act, and we need help. Or we are reforming our forest legislation, and we need help. And with very few exceptions, the, our answer had to be no, because we didn't have the human resources, we didn't have the time, I'm a judge by profession and a volunteer 
um, as an environmental law expert, but my main job is my court. And the same thing with other members of the World Commission on Environmental Law, including Justice Bambang and uh, Ma Santosa and Rita and, and several, several others. And that was devastating to see later on, I'm not going to name countries, but there are, for example, two countries in this region that asked for our help. We couldn't help. And the result is that they enacted, there was, the political will was there to enact good forest legislation, and they ended up enacting legislation that is not so good. And then, you know, we think we could have done more. So the World Commission on Environmental Law and our president, uh, Professor Christina Voigt from the University of Oslo Law School, she succeeded me. Professor Voigt um, continued with this, um, uh, this idea that we had um, when I was president, and then the United Nations Environmental Program and the Global Judicial Institute on the Environment joined forces with the Asian Development Bank, especially our colleague uh, Christina Pack and the General Counsel uh, uh, Tom Clark. And we uh, then decided to launch the Model Forest Act initiative. We have not launched it yet, so this is a, um, see the importance of Indonesia? Here I am discussing something that will be launched in New York in three weeks at the United Nations. We got together and we hope we can bring in the, the Indonesian judiciary, the Indonesian center of environmental law and other institutions, the Ministry of the Environment of, of Indonesia, uh, C4 that I'll be visiting tomorrow. Um, I think C4 is also in, in Bogar, right? In Bogar. Um, so we will be launching in New York in mid-July the Model Forest Initiative, uh, Model Forest Act Initiative. The goal is very simple. In three years, to draft what we would consider the very best cutting edge set of norms with commentaries, but in those three years, just the general part of the Model Forest Act. Later, we hope, we would draft the specialized parts, for example, a chapter on forest concessions, a chapter on protected areas, on and on. But the general part, the basic skeleton of the whole structure, we hope to have it done in three years. And the main focus is not temperate forest. The main focus is tropical forest. And based on what I said at the beginning of my conversation today, I, Indonesia is absolutely central to uh, this exercise that we will be conducting in the next three years. Once the Model Forest Act is done, the general part of it, it will be available online, and let's say, uh, country X, uh, small country, no technical expertise uh, or deep technical expertise in those matters, complex legal matters, will, if they decide to reform their legislation or enact a new law, they would just go there as if they were in a supermarket with a little cart and say, I like that. I like that, I don't like this, this is not relevant for us, it's contrary to our traditions, I don't like that either, and would 
uh, this would facilitate uh, the work of legislators and also judges uh, around, around the world. And why do I say judges? And I end here. I say judges because we judges see ourselves as the enforcers of norms. But when we enforce norms, often we are not enacting new norms, but we might be given new understanding about, new, um, about those norms, incorporating legal principles that are emerging in other courts around the world. For example, today, uh, Justice Bang Bang mentioned the indubio pro natura principle that's now being used by Supreme Courts and courts in different parts of the world. Meaning that, and this applies to forest legislation, um, if we are applying a norm, and this norm has two, three, four possible meanings, I should apply the indubio pro natura. In other words, if I, as a general rule, I should apply the meaning, the interpretation that is most protective to the environment and to the forest. Or if I don't want to apply that most protective meaning, I have to clearly justify in my judgment why I am not applying the most protective interpretation of that particular norm. So that's the indubio pro natura uh, principle that in fact there are already decisions in uh, judgments in Indonesia uh, that have um, joined the, the world judicial community in uh, the development of the indubio pro natura uh, principle. So I think, Greta, I stop here, and then we can have a conversation. And the, my intention here is really to, um, to listen to you. What do you think, from your perspective, are the most important challenge that forest legislation uh, faces in this, uh, in this country? And what are the challenges that you, as judges, face in applying those, uh, those norms? I know a little bit about your system and your forest legislation and your constitutional arrangement. I would have one or two uh, points that I think are challenging in, in the Indonesian legal system, but I would rather listen, uh, listen to you from your own experience. You are the experts on Indonesian uh, forest legislation, and I would be delighted if you could help me in uh, just highlighting some of the problems uh, that you see. So I can take this uh, to New York in three, in three weeks. And later on, when we begin working um, on, on the, the drafting committee, uh, when we begin working on uh, the general part of the Model Forest Act, uh, then perhaps we could come uh, back here with the first rough draft and then have a discussion in one or two days uh, with um, Indonesian judges uh, perhaps next year. So many thanks. Terima kasih banyak, Justice Antonio. Thank you very much, Justice Antonio. So we can um, go to the dialogue session, right? So, yeah, um, I uh, allow me to, you know, uh, just strolling around to um, ke peserta. Bapak dan Ibu ini um, hal yang sangat menarik sekali, Bapak dan Ibu, dan sangat penting. Kenapa uh, kita melihat bagaimana seperti yang tadi uh, Justice Antonio katakan uh, forest norms. Forest legislation itu hal yang sangat 
apa sangat kompleks dan sangat diverse dari berbagai negara dan ini memerlukan pendekatan yang sangat holistik karena pendekatannya itu tidak hanya kita bicara tentang hutan tapi kita bicara bagaimana interconnectionnya dengan water misalnya dengan air water norms kita bicara interconnectionnya dengan wildlife protection misalnya dan um, legislasi yang ada saat ini Justice Antonio melihatnya cenderung fragmented gitu Dan ini kemudian mungkin at some point jadi challenges sebagai, uh, kepada uh, hakim-hakim, judges ketika kita mengenforce uh, apa namanya mengenforce um, law tersebut, mengenforce hukum tersebut. Nah, oleh karena itu kemudian uh, Justice Antonio me, apa, menginisiasi yang namanya Model Forest Act Initiative untuk bisa mem, membentuk satu uh, pendekatan yang holistik uh, terkait dengan norms forest norms ini sendiri. Dan um, ini akan di launch. Uh, Tiga minggu lagi di New York, beliau katakan, uh, dan akan uh, selama beberapa tahun, tiga tahun ke depan akan mencoba uh, menyusun kerangkanya dengan uh, uh, dengan uh, partisipasi de- dari berbagai uh, stakeholders terkait, termasuk Indonesia. Nah, oleh karena itu, uh, Profesor, uh, mohon maaf, Justice Antonio sangat berkenan sekali berdialog dengan Bapak dan Ibu. Tadi uh, beliau memberikan dua uh, pertanyaan pemantik untuk dialog kita. Jadi menurut Bapak dan Ibu kira-kira hal apa atau challenge apa, tantangan terbesar apa yang ada saat ini terkait dengan um, sektor kehutanan, terkait dengan forestry issues. Dan khusus untuk hakim, apa challenge terbesar juga yang dihadapi oleh hakim untuk applying norms yang ada di Indonesia. Mungkin ada yang ingin um, sharing dulu Bapak dan Ibu, saya izin ada mic-nya, ya ada satu, ada mic-nya Mas? Ya Bapak dua, saya izin pakai mic ini dulu berarti. Does the interpretation work? Yes, okay. Boleh Bapak. Bapak, kemudian Ibu ya Ibu. Ya. Oke. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning uh, for Justice Antonio. Izin Pak Kabadan, uh, saya mau menyampaikan dalam bahasa. Antonio, pada pidato awalmu saya sangat setuju bahwa bahasa dunia yang dikembangkan saat ini bukan lagi bahasa ibu masing-masing. Jadi, Tidak ada sama sekali hambatan buat kita masyarakat dunia, baik itu yang di Perancis, yang di Amerika, yang di Jepang, ataupun bahkan di Brazil dan Indonesia untuk memiliki bahasa yang sama. Dan isu hari ini ya, yang menyatukan kita dalam satu bahasa adalah eh, bahasa lingkungan hidup. Ya. Maka orang di dunia itu berbicara grammarnya itu adalah grammar environmental ethic dan ecological justice. Itu saya setuju, maka oleh karenanya kalau masyarakat dunia saja disatukan pada isu yang sama yakni isu environmental ethic dan environmental justice itu, maka lebih-lebih lagi aparatur hukumnya terutama hakim-hakimnya karena memang Justice Antonio juga basisnya adalah hakim maka kita bisa disatukan pada isu ini. Uh, saya tentu saja sangat terhormat bisa berbicara di depan uh, Justice Antonio, karena Justice Antonio yang saya uh, kenal ini adalah dulu sangat terkenal sekali di negaranya, dia adalah uh, kepala uh, pengadilan uh, Tribunal Superior Elektoral yang melalui uh, beliau salah satunya tumbang itu, dimakzulkan itu Dilma Rousseff dan pasangannya. So, uh, itu paling tidak menginspirasi saya bahwa hakim itu tidak bicara pada hakimnya sendiri, pada hukum itu tidak bicara pada hukumnya sendiri, tapi seorang hakim juga bisa bicara banyak uh, kaitannya dengan termasuk juga aspek politik, ya politik dalam pengertian kesejahteraan. Itu nanti Secara pribadi nanti saya akan bicara yang itu dengan uh, Antonio. Yang mau saya sampaikan poinnya adalah, Mr. Antonio, bahwa di masing-masing negara, terutama di Indonesia, kita tidak pernah ada masalah kaitannya dengan membangun 
sebuah undang-undang kaitannya dengan perlindungan pada lingkungan. Indonesia memiliki banyak sekali ketentuan hukum dan undang-undang lingkungan. Hanya saja, ya, eh, negeri ini adalah negeri yang berkembang, negeri yang masih ingin membangun ekonominya, sehingga pada sisi yang lain ada aspek juga pemerintah itu membangun sebuah ketentuan hukum dan undang-undang yang pada akhirnya ya, itu menegasikan, ya, meminggirkan hukum-hukum yang mengatur terkait mengenai lingkungan. Pada akhirnya problemnya adalah masih soal ekonomi versus ecological versus environmental. Semangatnya itu memang ada, tapi memang pada aspek-aspek lain pemerintah juga membangun sebuah ketentuan-ketentuan yang akhirnya menegasikan kaitannya dengan uh, lingkungan itu. Bagaimana tidak misalnya pembangunan terkait perkebunan sawit di Indonesia itu begitu masif. Jumlahnya itu bahkan dalam prakteknya melebihi daripada izin ya, pembukaan terhadap lahan itu sendiri. Lalu kemudian kebijakannya terakhir, jumlah yang sudah melebihi itu diputihkan lalu kemudian dilegalkan. itu. Ini jadi problem antara ekonomi versus ekologikal. Sehingga kemudian ketika problem itu digugat di pengadilan, hakim akan berhadapan dengan apakah dia harus membela kepentingan pemerintah untuk membangun ekonomi ya, melalui apa, perluasan lahan-lahan sawit yang tidak semestinya itu, atau kemudian memilih kepentingan pada environmental ethic atau ecological, ecological justice itu sendiri. Nah, saya menarik tadi apa yang ditawarkan oleh uh, Justice Antonio bahwa ya, ke depan kita sebagai negara pemilik hutan terbesar, Indonesia, Brazil, Kongo, itu harusnya memiliki sebuah komunikasi yang intensif, terutama aparatur hukumnya. Dan ini menarik, apakah ya, sebuah hubungan ini nanti, ya, kelompok ini, kelompok negara-negara yang memiliki hutan-hutan yang besar ini, dia memiliki suara yang lebih yang harusnya bisa didengar, anggota-anggota di dalamnya ini, untuk kemudian menyuarakan atau bahkan ya, menggugat terkait mengenai kebijakan-kebijakan di negaranya masing-masing itu terkait mengenai pembangunan-pembangunan ekonomi yang merusak lingkungan itu. Saya mau mengatakan bahwa isu lingkungan hidup itu bukan isu uh, imaji, isu lingkungan itu konkret. Kita bicara lingkungan, menjaga hutan, menjaga pohon-pohon untuk tetap tumbuh itu karena kaitannya dengan ketersediaan air, karena kaitannya ketersediaan dengan makanan. Teknologi yang berkembang hebat saat ini, misalnya artificial intelligence, itu dia tidak bisa menghasilkan makanan dan tidak bisa menghasilkan air. Pergi kita kemana-mana, tidak ada AI yang sampai dengan hari ini bisa membuat hutan. Tidak ada. Air yang bisa menciptakan bumi dan biodiversity. Sehingga kemudian ketika lingkungan rusak, maka rusak semua termasuk makanan, termasuk air, termasuk kehidupan di dalamnya itu. Pemahaman terkait mengenai inilah yang menjadi problem karena Pemerintah pada negara-negara berkembang masih menganggap bahwa soal lingkungan hidup ini, soal menjaga hutan, soal menjaga udara yang bersih, soal menjaga air yang bersih itu adalah persoalan yang lain dari persoalan pembangunan ekonomi. Ketika dibangun sebuah industri, maka dibangun sebetulnya pemukiman-pemukiman di sana sehingga kemudian membutuhkan lahan yang besar untuk itu. Di sini problem sehingga kemudian apakah nanti pertemuan-pertemuan yang akan digagas oleh Justice Antonio termasuk di dalamnya di situ menjadi semacam tempat untuk masyarakat dunia terutama masyarakat pemilik hutan-hutan yang sangat luas itu menyuarakan bahwa penting uh, untuk tetap menjaga kelestarian lingkungan hidup biodiversity termasuk menekan pemerintah di negara-negara yang pembangunan ekonominya itu merusak lingkungan Terima kasih dari saya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, we have another one 
and then uh, uh, your response afterwards. Ya, Ibu, silakan. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Rika Tama. I'm the judge in this center of education here. Um, firstly, I want to share a few stories about my experience in the North Kalimantan. I was a judge in the North Kalimantan a few years ago. And I've been dealing, I've been facing the traditional tribes has to deal with the very basic issue. Uh, there is a tree named Ulin Tree. Ulin Tree, Tembesi Tree that will grow for 700 years. And I've been telling the offenders that if you even live for 100 years and you are dead, and you get back to life, and you are dead again, and you get back to life and you're dead again, you can only grow one tree. So uh, we cannot, uh, we have to stop, the, we have to stop using them for their basic need, that the basic need is home, housing. Housing is their basic need. So we have to face the problem that we have to punish them in the same time they don't have alternative to build a house without that kind of tree because the counter of the land, the counter of the land was mud. So it's the only existing it's the only existing wood that will be a good house. Uh, based on your experience, on social forestry, social engineering is something that um, interesting for me because uh, social engineering will always be the base of any kind of regulation that can be, uh, can be implemented. Based on your experience in Brazil, uh, if there are anything you can share here based on your experience, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, terima kasih, Ibu. Um, so we have several responses actually um, when we talk about the challenges. Um, first, the dichotomy between economy and ecological, right? And then um, the, uh, how we can, uh, uh, because Indonesia is full of traditional tribes. Um, What's the best approaches for the local uh, local people, for example, indigenous people who uses um, forests for daily lives? Will the judges uh, shall the judges punish them, or is there another approaches like social forestry or the others in, in, in your perspectives? And will the series of meetings that we, you will conduct um, uh, during the Model Forest Initiative? Uh, act uh, will be a venue for local people to uh, to share their voices um, about their challenges um, throughout the years. Go on. Um, okay. Well, thank you for uh, the two interventions. <clears throat> let me let me begin um, with uh, this difficult challenge of governments that enact environmental legislation and then they are the first ones to violate the environmental legislation. This is common all over the world. And often we come um, the re to the result that um, in Portuguese we say that this is a schizophrenic system because you have a part of the government saying something and another part of the government doing the opposite. And we judges are in the middle. And we are supposed to decide cases. Uh, and this is not an easy, an easy task. Perhaps we could hear just mention a few very broad aspects uh, of this, um, this problem. The first is that if we have laws, in theory, they have to be applied. And this is a challenge that we judges face every day. 
we face in criminal law. You see a situation that you said, you know, if I didn't have this law that is so strict, I would not punish this person. But the law requires me to punish this person and doesn't have um, a justification for not punishing. So this is a feeling that is not unique to environmental law. The same thing in family law. And you also have Sharia law. So there are situations in which we, as judges, say, you know, I wish I could decide differently. But if the law says this, I have to apply the law, or at least, you know, the, the maximum we can do is uh, to give an interpretation that it makes it a little bit more flexible. So this is the first point. This type of dilemma is not unique to decide in environmental cases. It's pervasive in uh, judicial decision making. The second aspect that I like to raise, and especially when we are dealing with indigenous people, your comment and yours too, is that the biggest deforestation we have in our countries is not done by indigenous people or by the poor. When we talk about massive deforestation in the Amazon or massive deforestation in Indonesia, this is done often by the elite. And then we use the examples of indigenous people, of someone that is very poor and needed to chop down a big tree and sell it, otherwise the family would go hungry. But the people that are destroying the forests in our countries, many of them, send their kids to study in Switzerland, not even in Indonesia or in Brazil. They don't live where the de destruction is being done. They live thousands of kilometers away. That's the type of deforestation that we are talking about. I'm not using pictures or um, slides, but I have a picture of how deforestation, this massive deforestation, is done in the Amazon. We have two gigantic tractors, you know, the ones that are used in the military, uh, and chains connected to both of them, and then they drive together and those chains they so the trees are not cut the trees are and we are talking about trees that are 500 years old 700 years old they are uprooted can the poor buy one of those tractors it's impossible they cannot buy even one meter of um, the chain, not even one tire of, one, uh, of, of those tractors. So that's the type of perpetrator we are talking about. Not the very, very poor and not indigenous people. Finally, in respect to indigenous people, uh, and the situation is different between uh, Indonesia and uh, in Brazil. In Brazil, the indigenous communities in the Amazon, for example, they don't build their, uh, their houses uh, in a way that you do in indigenous communities here in Indonesia. Because they have to, to, to be built with light materials. They move. 
they migrate, uh, as opposed to building something that will stay there for 200 years or, uh, or 300 years, depending on the quality of the wood. So I cannot really speak about the Indonesian situation. In my country, the problem exists more in respect to wildlife hunting or fishing than in, in respect to destruction of the forest done uh, by indigenous people because they, they, they uh, uh, chop down trees in one area they use it for five years, then they, the whole community move uh, to another area, and the forest uh, regenerates in, in, in the previous area. But for hunting, um, this, this is an issue. And the big question, for example, that I don't intend to uh, go into now, since we are discussing forest and in, in not wildlife, is whether um, any person, has a right to kill the very last specimen of a, a species. Does the legal system, is this consistent with the legal system? So let's say that you have a, a species of bird and there are just 50 of them in the wild can hunting of this species, even by indigenous people, be allowed? That's a, uh, a question that I don't have the answer um, or an answer in, in five uh, words. Um, but here we're discussing forests today, not, not wildlife. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Finally, oh, yeah. um, remember that economy and ecology, they both come from the same Greek word, oikos, which means house. So ecology and economy should live in the same house, should not be antagonist, as you correctly uh, uh, stated. Yeah, thank you, Justice. Um, in respect to the uh, indigenous people, uh, the last question is, uh, will the series of discussions when you discuss about uh, the this model Forest Act initiative uh, become a venue to the indigenous people to, or local people to voice, uh, to share their, their voices uh, about these challenges? Absolutely. We cannot discuss the protection of forests without uh, the inclusion of indigenous people. If you look at the map, of forests in the world, at least in the Amazon, you are going to see that the best protected areas in the Amazon are under uh, indigenous people land. You can see that by satellite. Okay, thank you, Justice. Um, saya mau ke uh, Bapak dan Ibu, sebelum ke Bapak dan Ibu kembali, uh, yang di Zoom ada mungkin, Mas, Mbak, boleh di-share? Apakah ada yang ingin bertanya via Zoom? Atau mungkin kalau ada yang ingin bertanya via Zoom, mungkin bisa uh, apa bisa raise hand Bapak dan Ibu, nanti mungkin Panitia bisa membantu saya uh, untuk ini ya, uh, untuk melihat pertanyaannya tersebut dan saya akan coba uh, mengkonekkan di sini dengan Justice Antonio. Uh, tadi Ibu satu, ada lagi Bapak dan Ibu? Oke, okay, Ibu dulu satu, kemudian nanti kita coba via Zoom ya. Silahkan Ibu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, yang ingin saya tanyakan di sini mungkin ini, apakah di Brazil atau di tempat negara-negara yang Mr. Benjamin uh, apa melakukan pengembangan atau diskusi dengan para ahli hutan uh, pernah di apa ditinjau dari segi agama ya Pak ya religi karena kalau yang ya mungkin sebagian rakyat eh, bangsa Indonesia atau yang saya pernah ikuti dari segi agama ini pohon ini adalah juga sebagian dari makhluk ini juga dia bernyawa bernapas 
dan merupakan makhluk uh, Tuhan yang juga perlu dikasih dikasihani jangankan untuk ditebang itu di ditebang hutan secara membabi buta bahkan ini harus kita pelihara karena dia bernyawa dan bahkan yang saya dapat ya mungkin bukan saya saja banyak teman-teman yang lain juga itu kita uh, dengan pohon saja itu harus memberi salam harus memberi salam uh, karena uh, dia juga bernyawa dan bernapas dan bahkan kalau kita mau nyiram itu kita niatkan untuk bersedekah untuk sedekah dan kita pohon-pohon dan kenyataannya uh, ini yang saya pengalaman saya saya nanam anggrek itu di depan halaman keluar gerbang sini sebelah uh, sebelah kiri itu memang kalau kalau pagi sebelum kantor kalau enggak sore setelah kantor karena memang saya tinggal di sini saya siram waktu saya siram ya saya beri salam saya saya apa uh, niatkan untuk sedekah dan ternyata berbunga bisa dilihat dan bunganya juga apa namanya enggak Ma, terus-terusan dan saya sayang untuk memotong saja bunga itu sayang kalau belum sampai habis e, kemudian saya bandingkan dengan yang di Jakarta rumah saya yang di Jakarta yang sehari-hari suami saya yang merawatnya padahal belinya itu sama-sama ya sama waktu saya beli separuh ditaruh di sana separuh di di sini nah di sana nggak bunga-bunga saya nggak tahu Bagaimana suami saya yang nyiram di sana atau apa? Itu kenyataannya seperti itu. Uh, bahkan kalau kita mau yang sudah tua saja, kita tuh sayang sekali. Kita harus minta maaf. Kita mau mau memotongnya aja, itu harus minta maaf. Maaf ya, uh, saya potong atau apa saya seperti itu. Nah, bagaimana kita tega? Karena itu merupakan makhluk uh, Tuhan juga. Bagaimana kita tega? Untuk membabat hutan dengan membabi buta. Apakah itu dilakukan secara pendekatan agama? Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum okay. warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih. Ini menarik sekali. Saya ada, uh, we have two questions on Zoom. Oke. Okay. Okay. Um, tadi saya lihat ada Prof. Bambang Hero uh, dan Bapak Rizky Ansyah. Mungkin bisa dibantu Pak Nitya. So we have Profesor Bambang Hero, for, uh, Professor in Forestry. Who, Oke. Okay. Pak Bambang. Prof. Bambang Heru, silakan Pak. Oke, okay, thank you moderator. And also yeah. good morning. Uh, judge uh, Benjamin Antonio. My name is Bambang Heru Sarjo. I am not a judge. I am an academician. I work at university as professor of forest protection. And I become an expert witness for more than... Uh, 23 years in 2000s, and I uh, involved in the case uh, about environmentals, and lastly, I'm working also in the corruption. Uh, it's about 600 cases, something like that. I've been to uh, Campo Grande near uh, San Paulo in 2018. That's how I joined the International Wildfire Conference there. And then one my colleague, Lara, now is the APO representative in forestry. I know also uh, several information about your country, especially when the Zonaro has been uh, shot at ICC in October 2021, because about 400,000 acres of deforestation done by uh, uh, his uh, uh, period, something like that. So uh, when I arrived there, a big fire is already there. That finally I, I saw this one, I don't know, one, but one million hectares. In Indonesia, it's 1.6 million hectares. That I actually we know from uh, uh, Vice President US because I joined the COP in Spain. And 2016, I joined the COP in Glasgow. And last year, I joined the COP at the uh, uh, Egypt. Uh, it's quite interesting the issue you are you're talking uh, today is about the uh, uh, Forest Initiative Act. So sometimes the question is, the, uh, what actually the forest would like to do for this kind of uh, uh, changing of climate now? Because uh, uh, we know uh, 
pollution like in Indonesia, we have 30 million hectares of forest been, you know, uh, destroyed or something. And also, uh, the regulation made sometimes is not obeyed. So, like uh, I agree with the previous uh, 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 participant asked about the uh, regulation, because uh, for instance, like what happened now in Indonesia, more than three million hectares oil palm already in the forest. And you know, uh, oil palm is not agriculture, but it's good. You should change status. But then, uh, the, our coordinating minister said, no, we will bleach it. So sometimes the question, you know, you know the, the uh, regulation might, the minister is lower than known. How could then, uh, uh, you know, uh, the statement by the minister could be allowable or uh, by others? Because sometimes, you know, uh, this is uh, not a good education for the law. And the second time, the second one is that even our minister of finance stated that the, the role of forest for the country is so small because they are only talking about money, money, and everything. But I agree with you. We are talking about environment, about the issue, and we are affected. You know, I joined 2000, uh, uh, joined 26 COP. That is being debated on one point of view of Celsius. You know, because uh, at the time, uh, developing uh, uh, developed country would like to, to stop the using of coal. But they said no. One of minister from Asia, minister of uh, uh, environment of uh, India said no, we cannot allow that one. Why? Because now we depend on even undeveloping countries. Because if you can keep us more money, then we can otherwise then how can we let our people die? Because we just, uh, just follow the decision we made today. So that we need this still using cool for our people. So it means again and again, we know the role of foreigners and then many regulations, I don't know, sometimes I don't remember every year they have new one and they change even sometimes uh, they are uh, against their uh, regulation itself. Uh, Bolsonaro president has been shoot in 2021, but Indonesian president also because of fire in 2015 also shoot by the NGO, friend of Earth in 2016. And then finally we know the results. They will reject all those things. So my question and again, what kind of forest uh, initiative act you would like to propose? Because many people also uh, told that uh, such kind of, uh, uh, of uh, pessimistic of the role of forest. I think that's all. Thank you very yeah. much. Terima kasih Pak Bambang Her uh, Pak Prof Bambang Hero. Tadi satu lagi saya melihat ada yang mengangkat tangan Pak Rizkyansyah kalau tidak salah. Boleh dibantu? Ya. Yeah. Um, yeah. Selamat siang. Uh, am I audible, Greta? Yes, you are uh, audible. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Gratul Justice Antonio. Uh, very impressive uh, presentations. So. Uh, well, actually, I haven't read the Free Forest Act model, but uh, conceptually from what you have to say, I think it's interesting because uh, it will create uh, interconnection between norms, um, not only with interconnection between norms, but also uh, the interconnection between law enforcers. Uh, in the Forest Act model that you propose, have there any opportunities for crop to crop communications in dealing with these problems? I mean, in the context of uh, judicial cooperation, because uh, we know that forest issues are, are also uh, cross border issues. That is the first question. Uh, the second question would be what are the opportunities for dispute uh, resolutions? I mean, the alternative dispute resolutions. For example, mediation in the forest act model, and then how, uh, from your perspective and your experience, how to ensure that mediation tools can be used uh, in an environmental context, in the sense that uh, the parties not just merely uh, uh, focus on their pragmatic uh, 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 interests. So that's the two questions that I would like to raise, and thank you, Justice, for your answers. I give back to you, Greta. 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Opa Arisikiansha. So you have a series of questions. <laughs> yeah, go on. I'll try to be brief in, in the answers. Well, first, on uh, the religious aspect of protection of forests. In many parts of the world, forests are protected not because of laws, but because of religious traditions. In Africa, and especially West Africa, for example, I have visited uh, the so-called uh, sacred groves. And sometimes it's the only piece of forest left, but that's where um, religious... Um, people go for, for their prayers, priests go there, and the forest is protected. The World Commission on Environmental Law published a book called Islam and the Environment. And it's available on law, uh, online. And the intention was to highlight the connections between the Holy Quran and the protection of the environment. There are beautiful parts in the Holy Book uh, about protecting the, and the need to protect nature. And not just in conjunction with water, so I do recommend that you take a look at this. Uh, it's not a big book, and I believe it's available on, online. So we do have to recognize in the Mortal Forest Act the spiritual connections that some people, some uh, groups of people, or even some cultures have uh, with forests. And we know that spirituality is very important. Um, spirituality and ethics in, uh, to law. And I think in the protection of forests, this is, this is critical too. The other question or comment was on the challenge of implementation. This is the most important challenge that the environmental law face. And it's even more complicated for us judges because many of those um, environmental laws that judges are required to enforce depend on, the, on administrative enforcement first. So imagine an environmental law that's been violated by the government itself. And the government is the one that should initiate an administrative procedure and inform the judge. You can see the problem, right? One could say, well, you know, NGOs could then report to judges and start litigation. But in many parts of the world, uh, NGOs are, um, are not very are powerful. In some countries they are banned or they are tolerated and they don't have access to justice. It's not the case of Indonesia, it's not the case of Brazil, but in many countries that's unfortunately still uh, the situation uh, we have. So in the Model Forest Act we have to deal not just with the design of a very good forest law, but also a whole chapter on implementation, on enforcement. It's not just the traditional forest law that you, um, you have a set of rights, obligations, uh, instruments, but you don't say much about the practice of uh, those provisions that are there. In our itinerary, so to speak, of the Model Forest Act, and this is already mentioned in the concept note. 
we do stress the importance of in, uh, enforcement and implementation. We have to, to deal with administrative sanctions. We have to deal with criminal sanctions. We have to deal with civil um, sanctions and remedies. And this takes me to the last question or comment uh, on the remedies. We judges should understand that the most important remedy in deforestation case is not compensation. Nature doesn't have a bank account. What nature needs is to be restored. So if a forest has been uh, uh, cut down illegally for soybean plantation or cattle ranching or palm oil or palm tree plantation, the remedy is not to pay back. We cannot assess that value. I remember that several years ago, uh, Justice Bam Bang and the Environmental Law Institute had an event, um, a training program on uh, environmental uh, civil liability. And I stressed to him, I said, make sure that judges understand that the most important remedy in deforestation is the, the, the least complicated of all, which is to require restoration with native species. Because we don't need to calculate how much that would cost. And then on the top of that, you add financial risk, uh, compensation for other types of damage. For example, for the period in which we are not going to have any forest there and the ecosystem services are lost. But remember, the main remedy is restoration. And for that, you just need the picture to show how the forest used to be. And nowadays, this is free on Google Maps. When I started an, as an environmental um, prosecutor in Sao Paulo um, 30 years ago or 40 years ago, a single picture from ne uh, NASA of a particular forest area cost $50,000. One picture. Nowadays we get all this for free. I repeat, most important remedy, restoration. And restoration um, as we say in, in Latin, in integrum, meaning total restoration, it might take 50 years, and ban the use of the land for other purpose. There is no need for sophisticated technical analysis, it's just what type of ecosystem is this? Uh, what are the main species that exist, the pioneer species and then uh, the other species, what's the time frame that this has to be followed, um, and reverse the burden of proof in terms of who is going to be reporting on the restoration process. It's not us, the judges, that should be going there every year. We can't do that. We don't have the means. We don't have the, the financial resources or the human resources to do it. You, the violator, every six months will report to the court with pictures uh, on uh, the status of the restoration. I guess that's, I covered most questions. Dispute resolution? Oh, uh. alternative dispute resolution. Well, alternative dispute resolution is always uh, a good solution, 
But it's a good solution if we don't, uh, if we respect some, the fundamentals of environmental law. Because I've seen alternative dispute resolution in which um, uh, it's agreed that, okay, I, I'll, I cut down illegally the, those old trees, you let me continue using the land, and I will pay uh, compensation for an orphanage. This is completely unacceptable. Because nature is, as I said, is not interested in money. Nature is interested in the restoration of the ecosystem and the ecosystem service that existed prior to the deforestation. Yeah, thank you, Justice. So this is very interesting because we have two schemes in here, right, in, in Indonesia regulation, right? We can, um, we can demand for compensation and we can also demand for environmental restoration. So we can do both. And this is important. Yeah, you, it's, it, that's correct. Yes. You have to do both, but the priority is always. Yes. There is one that is um, absolutely necessary in every situation, which is restoration with native species. Yes. And then, depending on the situation, you might add financial compensation on the top of it. Yeah. But not the other way. Say, I'm first, um, yeah, pay financial compensation, yeah. and then I might restore a little piece of it, 10%, yeah. Uh, yeah. 20%. Yeah, I do agree with that. Um, Bapak dan Ibu saya diberitahu uh, panitia bahwa kita uh, masih ada 6 menit lagi. Saya ada satu pertanyaan terakhir mungkin? Ya. Boleh. Uh, one last question and then um, your closing remarks. Cek. Terima kasih atas waktu yang diberikan. Saya cerita pengalaman saya. Tahun 2008 sampai 2012 saya pernah bekerja di tambang batu bara, di mana dalam empat tahun terakhir itu saya bekerja di Kutai Barat ada turban turbai dokol maning, kedua saya pindah ke Gunung Bayan di Kutai Kartanegara, dan terakhir saya ditugaskan di Kutai Timur ada brokol di sana, di mana dalam proses tambang batu bara itu ada pertama kali itu adalah survei, survei lahan, kemudian kedua ada land clearing, penebangan hutan, atau pe pembersihan lahan. Ketiga itu adalah drilling, pengoboman tanah. Keempat itu adalah blast, drilling itu mengebor ya. Kemudian di blasting, di, di bom tanah itu, kemudian terakhir, kemudian ada hauling, dan terakhir mining. Dan seharusnya setelah mining, itu adalah reklamasi, atau penghijauan kembali, atau menimbun tanah yang sudah digali. Yang mau saya tanyakan di sini masalahnya adalah yang saya perhatikan dalam empat tahun terakhir saya bekerja di tambang batubara itu ada masalah di reklamasi yaitu tidak menghijaukan kembali atau tidak menimbun kembali hutan yang sudah atau tanah yang sudah diambil batubaranya tapi tidak ditimbun kembali. Kemudian apakah di Brazil ada yang peraturan yang mengatur yang mewajibkan setiap tambang yang sudah digali harus dihijaukan kembali atau direklamasi. Mungkin ada aturan yang kurang tegas di Indonesia sehingga uh, hutan itu tidak, tidak ditimbun kembali. Mungkin di Brazil bisa memberikan contoh supaya Indonesia bisa mengikutinya. Terima kasih. Ya, terima kasih Bapak. Ini uh, so this is also interesting about reclamation after the mining, post mining. Uh, what's the regulation um, in Brazil? Because in here, uh, we have the regulation as well, but the enforcement is kind of weak. Um, whether um, Brazil has stronger regulation on that, maybe we can share um, your perspectives, yes. Well, we, we, I believe we all understand that uh, deforestation for mining and def deforestation for agriculture are different. Uh, the first, the, the type of impact is different. Um, the time frame is different. 
Um, and the restoration is different. When you mine, you basically are destroying not just the forest, but you are destroying the soil in which uh, the forest um, used to seed. Whereas in agriculture, you basically want to keep the soil uh, intact as much as possible uh, and get rid of the forest because the forest competes with uh, whatever you want to plant. Therefore, deforestation in mining is more complicated than deforestation uh, in, for agriculture or uh, cattle ranching. It's more complicated. And there will be cases in mining in which complete restoration will be impossible. Because you, you might end up with a big hole that is 100 meters or 200 meters deep. How can you fill uh, this, this big ro uh, hole that will probably become a lake? In other types of mining, what it's usually done is to take this top soil, that's the fertile soil, put in storage, and then once uh, the mine is closed, and assuming that you, know, you are not going to have a, uh, a gigantic big hole, then you restore that and cover with the top soil, and then plant trees, and, and the forest might come back. Mining has other uh, consequences that affect forest, and this has to do with contamination. So it's not just deforestation, but it can be contamination uh, in contamination of the groundwater, of groundwater, but also underground water and rivers. And this disturbs the whole uh, river basin depending on the type of mechanisms you have uh, to um, fully insula insulate that, that operation. The general rule is that in the permitting process, um, we already state what types of reclamation and restoration we are going to have. But remember, some of those mines will be in operation for 40 years. 50 years, can be 100 years. And uh, so it's much more complicated than, than in, in, in agriculture. And depending on the type of mining, that rule that we enunciated for deforestation, that first restore, then pay compensation, in some mining cases, restoration will be impossible and then compensation, um, uh, financial compensation and ecological compensation. One of the largest, if not the largest, iron mine in the, in the world is in Brazil. Um, a Brazilian company that um, uh, operates in Indonesia too, or at least used to, uh, to operate, and one of the requirements for the permitting process in the 70s was that you are going to set up and protect a large uh, area of forest. So a public park was created next to the mine, and the mining company, and I'm talking about a very large protected area, and the company uh, uh, has the responsibility to make sure that the boundaries uh, of this protected area uh, are respected and the, the protected area itself is, um, uh, is protected. Okay, so the, the permitting process plays the vital role in here. 
Oke, okay, uh, begitu Bapak dan Ibu. Uh, jadi memang pada akhirnya proses perizinan bagaimana safeguard dalam proses perizinannya itu betul-betul didetailkan proses reklamasinya seperti apa, restoration harus seperti apa, itu harus betul-betul dilihat sejak awal kalau uh, kalau dari sisi Brazil. So this is the last question, Justice yes, Antonio. Would you like to give the closing remarks? Um, I think um, just one word of gratitude again. It has been a great pleasure. Uh, thank you for your, your questions. I know that this is a diverse uh, group of people. Uh, we have experts here in administrative law, family law, criminal law. Um, but remember, it doesn't matter what is your area of jurisdiction. As the director, one of the directors of the Judicial uh, Training Center said in, in, uh, at the opening of our conversation, the environment is the common language that unites us. Of course, we, we as judges have other uh, common language, other topics that are critical for us, uh, one of them being learning. Nowadays, we divide the judiciaries in the world in two main categories. The ones that have good judicial education and the ones that have bad judicial education or no judicial education whatsoever. And the good news is that both Brazil and Indonesia are countries with good judicial education. And this is the very first step for being a good judge. One could say, well, the very first step is to be a good human being, have character, have integrity. Yeah, but that, those are the threshold to become a judge. But in terms of real life as a judge, the first step is to be open to learn, permanently learning. A judge that thinks, you know, I know everything. This is so common to all of us, right? I mean, judges, we judges tend to be arrogant. And why is that? Why are we arrogant? Is that because we are different people? No, it's because of the nature of what we do. We are the ones that decide what, when life begins or what life is. We are the ones to decide when the person is dead. So we decide about death. And we are the ones that decide about love. Imagine how powerful we are. And if we are not careful, we become arrogant. And we think, oh, we know everything. Um, but I'm delighted to see that in Indonesia, the judges are part of this growing group of judges around the world that understand that being a judge is a daily uh, exercise on humility. We need to learn about the law, and we need to learn about the science and other areas of knowledge that make law possible and make law even logical. So congratulations to all of you, and I do hope uh, to come back, and I do hope that you visit us in Brazil as well. This is a dialogue that I suspect is just beginning and all the avenues are open for us, including the technology uh, to and the interpretation. Again, many thanks to the interpreter uh, for this dialogue to proceed. Many thanks. Thank you, uh, Justice Antonio Benyamin. So for sure, this is just the beginning. Um, and we are very much looking forward to have further discussions with you about the initiative and um, about our environmental protection for sure. 
Bapak dan Ibu saya mohon izin uh, terima kasih banyak untuk perhatiannya dan untuk um, tanggapannya dan sebagainya sangat senang sekali berada di diskusi yang hangat pada siang hari ini. Saya mohon maaf Bapak dan Ibu jika ada yang kurang berkenan, um, saya selalu berharap semoga Bapak dan Ibu selalu sehat selalu. Terima kasih, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, selamat siang. Saya kembalikan ke MC. Terima kasih kepada Bapak Antonio Herman Benjamin dan Ibu Grita Anindarini. Dimohon untuk kembali ke tempat. Hadirin yang kami hormati, acara ceramah umum dengan tema The Model Forest Act Initiative telah selesai. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Kepada yang terhormat Kepala Badan Litbang Diklat Hukum dan Peradilan Mahkamah Agung Republik Indonesia, beserta jajaran pimpinan, dan Bapak Antonio Herman Benjamin, Dimohon untuk foto bersama para undangan yang hadir secara langsung dan daring. Baik, mohon untuk Bapak dan Ibu para tamu undangan virtu, secara virtual untuk menghidupkan video. Baik, Bapak dan Ibu, dalam hitungan ketiga, satu, dua, tiga. Satu, dua, tiga. Menggunakan gaya korpu. Baik. Satu, dua, tiga. Sekali lagi. Satu, dua, tiga. Baik. Terima kasih Bapak dan Ibu. Para undangan yang hadir secara daring dapat meninggalkan ruang Zoom Meeting. Acara dilanjutkan dengan ramah tamah. Terima kasih. Bagi para hakim justisial dan tamu undangan, acara ramah tamah ada di ruang VVIP. Sementara untuk undangan yang lain, di ruang auditorium. Terima kasih.